Good afternoon, everyone. This is Alan Murabayashi speaking to you from the Photo Shelter World Headquarters here in New York. Thanks for joining us for another episode of I Love Photography Live. Today it's only me. My co-host Sarah Jacobs is off on vacation in Europe, armed with a Sigma 50mm f1.4 DGH SM lens, which she uh, rented from Lens Pro to go. Uh, looking forward to seeing those photos in a week or two, Sarah J. We have a lot to talk about as usual here on the broadcast. If you're watching us on YouTube at youtube.com slash photoshelter, you'll be able to see all of the images that we have. If you're not and you're listening to the podcast, you can go to blog.photoshelter.com to uh, get all the links to everything that we're looking at today. And as usual, it's a full list of items. First, uh, we want to start with this tragedy of the Malaysian Airlines uh, plane being shot down or allegedly being shot down. I don't really know what to say uh, about this. First of all, Malaysia Airlines just having the worst luck in the world for an airline and, and some pundits are saying whether the airline itself can, can actually recover after having two major tragedies uh, within four months of each other. First of all, the plane that has disappeared. Um, People still can't find it. Uh, there are Australian ships and Chinese ships and Malaysian ships uh, going across the ocean trying to find that jet. And then yesterday, uh, allegedly pro-Russia separatists used a uh, missile to shoot down this airline uh, for reasons that are unclear. I suspect that they didn't know it was a passenger airliner. I hope they knew it wasn't a passenger airliner. Whatever the case may be, uh, the photos are coming in, um, and it's it's heartbreaking. Um, and the other piece of information that is, has come out today is that there were over a hundred people that were going to attend an AIDS conference on this plane, including some of the top researchers in the field. Uh, and I don't know if it's a bit of hyperbole, but somebody said in social media that the cure for AIDS might have been on this plane. Um, and when you think about the the tragedy of AIDS and how many lives will be lost. Additionally, because this brain power isn't there, it's a little, it's a little disheartening. At any rate, they said uh, the plane crashed into a wheat field. We're seeing these images. They said for whatever reason, a lot of the bodies are intact. Um, so people are going through these fields, covering them. Um, and this is coverage that we're seeing from the New York Times uh, with a lot of different photos. This is Brendan Hoffman from Getty Image, Images uh, covering this stuff. And then in the Ukraine and Dutch embassies, etc., People are going around, um, and clearly, I guess uh, the the smell of bodies and burn uh, burned plane, etc. So you're seeing images here from Dominique Fage from uh, AFP. Uh, just a tragedy, a real tragedy. Hopefully, we'll we'll find out more information. Uh, somebody allegedly stole the black boxes already. Uh, interesting to see the role of photography in all of this, uh, of course. Um, we're not seeing, thankfully, through mainstream media, bodies um, that haven't been covered, even though that's the descriptions that we're seeing, you know, seeing literally bodies littering the fields there. Um, but enough to see this, this destruction through the photographs to get a sense of what that uh, scene is like. Our best goes out to the families of uh, the victims there. Over on Petapixel, an interesting article, which is something that I've thought about a lot. So a lot of you know Joey L., the former teen, I guess we could call him a, a prodigy in some ways, seeing that he was doing commercial shoots as a teenager. Uh, but at any rate, he uh, was contacted by another photographer, Anthony Kurtz, who was going through old photos from 2007 and thought he spotted Joey L., in some of his photos. So he contacted Joey L on Twitter and they had an exchange where they sent high-res images to one another. And it's really kind of interesting. Um, and Joey's piece is something that I've thought of a lot before, which is nowadays so many people have cameras and you could be walking anywhere, you know, any tourist spot or non-tourist spot and someone's taking a photo or maybe a security camera is taking a photo of you. And how many images of you exist that you, you're unaware of. Now Facebook has all of these researchers using uh, facial recognition which is supposed to be amazingly incredible. Um, I think they were saying like 96 percent, 97 percent recognition capability. Uh, and so 
in theory, if privacy was a non-concern, it would be amazing if every photo was in the cloud and then you could somehow get all of these photos of yourself. You know, on your deathbed, you're about to, to pass away and you get to see this entire treasure trove of images of you that other people have shot or security cameras have shot. It's just kind of interesting. Uh, it doesn't creep me out that much for some reason. I just I, I would just love to see these photos. And and having this type of discovery that Joe Yell had because of Anthony Kurtz's photos is kind of neat. And so he goes on and he's he's saying, well, you know, this was me taking a photo uh, on the riverbank here. And towards the bottom of the article, you get to see Joey's photo, which is really kind of cool. And so Joey surmises, well, Anthony must have been on one of the boats in the background to have taken this photo. I wonder which boat it was. Just kind of cool. Well, the other thing that sort of struck me is he was 17 when he shot this. That's a pretty darn good photo for a 17-year-old. So, hey, if anyone has photos of me, send them over. I'm, I'm, I'm definitely interested in that stuff. The Daily News reports Yale graduate, 23-year-old Greg Hindi, spent a year walking across the U.S., 9,000 miles across the country, without speaking and without technology. Well, he had some technology. He had GPS. And he had a tent. And the other thing he did was he carried around a 4x5 camera. And as he would photograph things, he would send the film back to his parents, who either developed them or put them aside for him to uh, develop when he got back. Now, none of, this, none of the photos have been published yet, uh, because he just finished his journey. And he just said his first words. He was saying that this was some sort of performance art piece. I don't get it. I'm a Yale grad. I don't get it. It just seems weird to me. Um, it is sort of interesting to see his, his photos of himself. I think he has some selfies um, of what he looked like when he left, just kind of like a kid with a backpack, and then he looks like a homeless dude <laughs> with a really shaggy hair. Um, but I'm very curious to see what those photos from the 4x5 look like. I have no idea what his photographic style is. I have to assume he has some interesting pictures in this, uh, off of this camera here. So Greg Hindi, we're waiting. I think he has another month or two that he's, he's going to walk back home. You know, me, eh, just get on a plane already. You know, the, the point has been made. You went a year, you walked 9,000 miles, you didn't say anything. He wrote... He, he wrote on notepads to communicate with people. I don't know if you watch The Leftovers on HBO, but there's a, you know, a sect of people who kind of do the same thing. They don't talk. Just kind of weird. Uh, two weeks ago, the U.S. played in the World Cup a valiant effort by goal, uh, goalkeeper Tim Howard. And then on Ad Week this past week, a really gorgeous cover uh, of him in all his tats with kind of a bluish... Uh, sheen on him, but then the old red rim light there. I don't know, I just like the photo. Um, and this popped up on SB Nation, which is a sports uh, sports blog. And just a really cool photo. They do not credit the photographer here, so I can't even tell you who took it, but the guy's a badass, man. It's funny, and I, we mentioned it on the on the show a couple weeks ago, but somebody changed the Wikipedia entry for the Secretary of Defense and they put Tim Howard as a Secretary of Defense after he had, I don't know, what was it, 15 saves um, or 16 saves, the most ever since they basically started tracking that stuff, I think in the 60s. So congratulations, Tim Howard. You got on the cover of Ad Week. I don't know really what that has to do. I guess you'll be getting some endorsements out of this, Mr. Hero. Over on Feature Shoot, uh, a project entitled Boomerang Kids, Portraits of Millennials Living Back Home with Mom and Dad. So if you're not aware of this term, the Boomerang Kids, well, it's so hard with st crushing student debt. Uh, underwriters aren't, aren't allowing people to get mortgages. It's much harder to get a mortgage after the subprime crisis. Uh, a lot of these people are, don't want to follow traditional paths for work and become doctors and lawyers. Um, and so photographer Damon Caceres has gone through um, and done photos of kids living at home. In this case, this is Jacqueline Boubion, 30 years old, living at home. This other one was Mikey uh, Billings, 29, living at home in North Carolina. And these people just trying to do their stuff. And the other thing uh, of the series, it shows how much student, how big their student loans were. 
So in this case, Mikey had $80,000 worth of student loans. Jacqueline had $22,000 in credit card debt with no student loans. I mean, just a crushing amount of debt. And so not so surprising. We make a big deal of it, uh, a big deal out of it in American culture, but from my understanding is, you know, in Italy, for example, this is just kids live at home until they're in their 30s or 40s or until they have kids. And, and even then, maybe they, they, they live at home. The cost of housing is, is just kind of crazy, depending on where you live. Um, but really, really nice portraits. It's just kind of interesting to see people that you would typically think would have their own place in their own separate lives, but for whatever reason, they are back at home. And there's nothing really to indicate that this is their parents' home. I guess in some cases, you know, when they're living in their high school room, like Alexandra Romo here, there are clearly indications that this was a child's room at some point. Or, you know, through the decor, it's like this is an older person's home. Um, so it's interesting in that respect, but, but I really like these uh, images. Uh, so in Russia, along the Ob River in Novosibir uh, Novosibirsk, Russia, I'm sure I slaughtered that, a very rare hailstorm and Nikita Dudnik shot these images of, they said, like golf ball size hailstorms. And there's a video to accompany this, which is so interesting because people are just chilling out. And then it starts to get a little windy and crazy. And then all of a sudden the hail comes down. Um, but what's interesting about this is that these were all shot on a smartphone. And I guess I shouldn't really be surprised at that anymore because a lot of breaking news images now come off of smartphones. But just kind of, it's still shocking to see hailstorms in the middle of summer, and then shocking to see that uh, a pretty darn good image came off of the smartphone. I actually found the still image to be much more compelling than the video because the video, she didn't shoot the video, but other people shot video, and it's just, you know, people are going around. There's no stabilization. They're not professional photographers. It just looks kind of crappy. So to see these well composed images uh, by Nikita. I think they're great. Um, speaking of Russia, <laughs> The Cut, a New York magazine, reports a new Instagram obsession, Russian women with many flowers. So apparently the wife or girlfriend of some Russian billionaire took a photo of herself with like a billion flowers. And then that became some sort of meme where all the Russian women wanted to photograph themselves, not with like a dozen flowers, but with like a dozen, dozen flowers. Instagram's weird as a as a mechanism, you know, we've said it's not a photo app, it's a distribution platform, but it's also a transmission, a meme transmission device, shall we say. Speaking of which, in case you haven't downloaded it, we just released the photo shelter uh, guide, the photographer's guide to Instagram uh, this week. Download it at photoshelter.com slash research. We interviewed a lot of people we talked to Jim Richardson from National Geographic, who's amassed uh, like 80,000 people on Instagram. We've talked to professional photographers who have anywhere from 2,000 to 830,000 followers. Uh, we asked them what that really means. Does, does that benefit their business? Is it part of their overall marketing plan, et cetera? Some really, really interesting nuggets. And one of the, uh, the people, the gal who has 830 followers, Pei Keetron, is doing a webinar with us next week. So check that out. I think it's on Tuesday or Wednesday. All this stuff is on the blog in case you want to register, register for us, uh, register for that. And I saw, we posted this on uh, our Facebook page and immediately people came out and said, whoa, well, so this feeds their ego. There's no uh, benefit to their bottom line. And I would say you're missing the point. Actually, people are making a lot of money by being hired by brands. When you have 800,000 people following you, brands will want to contact you. They want you to photograph things and reach their, have their brand reach your following. So there's a girl on, um, on Instagram named Alice Gao who just finished a Memphis road trip or a, a road trip of the South and was hired by Lincoln Motor Cars. She was also hired by Cartier. So all you old timers who are questioning what the value of building uh, a large following is, I, I think you might want to listen to the webinar next week. So join us for that. And in the meantime, if you're a Russian woman and you like flowers, go ahead and take a lot of photos of yourself with flowers because that's apparently a thing. 
I can't believe that it's been 25 years since when Harry Met Sally came out and over on the magazine again, they had photos from the premiere of When Harry Met Sally in 1989. And I'm not a big like star follower person, but it's interesting just to see the fashion because obviously stars are going to be the most fashionable people at, at any given moment, generally speaking. And to see the, the hairstyles and the clothing, and oh my, look at this. It's O.J. Simpson with his former wife, who he allegedly killed, Nicole Simpson. Um, and to see all of this before it went down, before the whole killing went down in 1994, um, and to see how young everyone looks. This is Scott Baio. Scott Baio. If you were alive in the 70s and you saw Happy Days and you know Scott Baio was a pretty big star, and I guess he was still a pretty big star in 89, and then I don't know what happened. But just so funny to see all of these images. Um, and I think they were talking, I don't know if it was in this article or not, but they were saying uh, there was a scene in When Harry Met Sally with the orgasm. And I think it was in Katz's Deli. And the owner of Katz's said people still come in 25 years later and reenact the scene. So funny to see this movie that had such a large impact, um, not only on the film landscape, but kind of in social culture. Uh, and people still kind of loving it. Demi Moore and uh, Bruce Willis. Bruce Willis when he had hair and, and they were both very young. Demi Moore hasn't really changed that much. Bruce Willis has gotten a little more haggard uh, than he was in 1989. But 25 years is a long time. We love to talk about selfies. And here we are on the Guardian site. This Pamplona uh, running with a bulls guy uh, tried to take a selfie while he was being chased by the Bulls, trying to take a freaking selfie. And so the police are searching for this guy because you're not supposed to sort of impede traffic and do things that are unsafe. I, it's such a sign of the times to see something like this. It's just kind of ridiculous. I mean, yeah, sure, if I went all the way to Pamplona, maybe I'd try to take a selfie, but I can't think of anything a whole lot more dangerous in the realm of selfies than trying to get a snap. Like, really? Is it really that important? Because somebody else got it for you. Rafa Rivas from AFP and Getty Images <laughs> took the photo of you being chased by the bulls. Wouldn't that suffice? I don't know. It's just, again, just kind of a crazy, crazy time for photography. The other thing that we love to talk about besides selfies, of co course, is drone photography. And the aerial site Dronestagram picked its 2014 winners for best drone photography. And they're pretty great. I got to say, you know, for all of the commotion that drone photography is making with the FAA and police departments and whatnot. The, the perspective, the aerial perspective is very, very cool. And what people are doing with drone photography, and you know, we've talked to Eric Chang from, formerly from Lytro and Apple and now with DJI Phantom. Look at this photograph. Uh, first place finisher uh, Capungero took this incredible photo of an eagle soaring over Barat National Park in Indonesia. And we talked about last week from uh, the 4th of July, there was that uh, drone, drone video flying through fireworks, which was just amazing. So kudos to everyone that entered and won uh, for Dronestagram. Keep doing what you're doing. FAA be damned. Police departments be, be damned. I think the perspectives that we're seeing are so interesting. And I don't know that I'm ever going to get tired of this perspective. I think because we see life at ground level, it's almost like you can't get oversaturated with good aerial photography. Good aerial photography. And, and in a way that, you know, traditional aerial photography where you had to be in an ultralight or a plane or a helicopter, you just couldn't get that low to your subject, but with your own photography, you can. So it's just really cool to see. Um, this really doesn't have to do a whole lot with photography, but it has to do with kind of like with photography. As you may have heard, uh, LeBron James has left the Miami Heat. If, you're, if you follow professional sports, you have to know who LeBron James is. If you follow uh, basketball, professional basketball here in the US, you know that LeBron James previously left Cleveland um, in an announcement called, quote, The Decision, which was a big ESPN special, which was ridiculed at the time. He did this, I don't know, four years ago. He went down to Miami. He joined Chris Bosh and Dwayne Wade. 
uh, and they promised to win not two, not three, not four, not five, not six, but seven or eight championships. They got to the finals four times, but they only won twice. Then he became a free agent this summer and was most likely going to rejoin with the Miami Heat, but decided to go back to his hometown of Cleveland, which shocked people, especially because the owner of the Cleveland team had really said some unkind things about LeBron when he left. At any rate, uh, the New York Times decided to make the least amount of commotion. Well, they made a lot of commotion in the least amount of words. So this was the Sports Saturday from last weekend. It is the entire front page of the sports section and a tiny, they take one out of one, two, three, four, five. Out of five columns, they use one column centered and they put a fake highlight over what says Cleveland Cavaliers. This is news. Transactions coming from the MLB, NBA, and NHL and it says Cleveland Cavaliers signed Ford LeBron James and that's it. And it was brilliant and a lot of people commented on this on, on social media. After we just got so inundated with LeBron coverage, this was sort of the perfect antidote and perfect response to all of that. So I love it. I love it. I love the fact that on a Saturday they could have a sense of humor and use something as prime, the prime real estate of the front page of the sports section uh, to highlight this. And really, I mean, it's highlighted. Literally, it's literally highlighted. The last thing that we want to show you today like good aerial photography, when you see a good time lapse, it's pretty mind blowing. And I have to say, I got a little burnt out on time lapse in the past year just because a lot of people did it really, really well. And people started uh, experimenting with tilt shift lenses. And you saw a lot of this stuff. And at a certain point, I got a little fatigued from it. But then I saw this. This one going around, this is uh, Rob Whitworth, who did this. He's, he's done a couple, but this has been kind of the, the best one. Um, and it's Barcelona. And I don't know what he did. I don't know how he did all of this stuff, like zooming in this way and sweeping across and the transitions through day and night. It is amazing. This thing is amazing, and he follows people around. I, I really don't understand how he was able to do this. Uh, at any rate, he says it took him 363 hours to complete, 78 hours for filming, and 179 hours of post-production using four Nikon DSLR cameras, which ate up 817 gigabytes of hard drive space. So kind of showing the point or illustrating the point that shooting the picture is really when you're dealing with video or even when you're dealing with still shooting the picture is nothing that time is nothing compared to the amount of post production that you have to do to make these things happen so rob man you knocked it out of the park that was that was truly truly amazing and again you can find all of these links on the blog we'll have them up to uh, later today at blog.photoshelter.com next week i'll be joined by ceo a photo shelter, Andrew Fingerman, he promised that he would be with us next week. I think we're going to do it on Thursday. So in case you have, have Friday marked down, you're going to have to change it because we're going to do it on Thursday. I found that a lot of people don't join us live. That's fine. Uh, but we'd love to have you join us live. But it doesn't help that we change the time sort of at, at our whim. But that's okay. You're probably watching it on YouTube or you're, you're listening to the podcast from uh, iTunes. And if you have any comments or questions, you can always send us a tweet at hashtag I love photo. Love to have your comments and questions or suggestions. Or if you find anything interesting, send it on over. Um, but join us next week. And for myself, Alan Murabayashi, we're signing off. Thanks for joining us for I Love Photography. We'll talk to you later. Bye-bye.